Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. So it's truly a privilege and honor for me to deliver a TEDx talk. So my topic today for today is about 4D printing and how 4D printing actually has the potential to really have an impact and change our lives. Okay. So some of the greatest inventions in science and engineering are inspired by nature. So I would like to share with you an example of a flower. On the on the left, this is a mimosa flower, or in Malay we call it pokok semalu. And on our right, this is just any random flower that we will come across in our daily life. So what's special about these plants and these flowers? The mimosa or the pokok semalu is a special plant that responds to touch. If I were to touch the leaves is going to close up, mucho, basically. And the, any flower that we deal with is sensitive to light. So this inspiration from nature can actually be a, can revolutionize science, engineering, and medicine. And I'm about to explain to you. Okay. So there are certain mechanisms, biological mechanisms, that enable the flower to expand and close. And similarly, there are some amazing chemical, biochemical processes that enable the plant to close up, the pokok smilu to close. So by mimicking, by mimicking these natural, uh, amazing creations, so we can actually adapt this to science and come up with new, novel technologies that can shape our future. Very much again. Right, I get the okay, guys, right slide. So for this, okay, with 3D printing technology that we have these days, we can print some of the most intricate designs, some of the most complex geometries that can be achieved by 3D printing. But 3D printing is not perfect. For example, if I were to 3D print the mimosa plant or 3D print the flower, I have the geometry, I have the shape, but that 3D printed uh, Mimosa plant, it's not going to be sensitive to my touch. It's not going to, the leaves are not going to close up. And similarly, for the flower, I can 3D print the most complex shaped flower by using 3D printing. But that flower is not going to open up and close uh, with relative to sunlight. So it's not going to respond to external stimuli. So that's one of the drawbacks that we have with 3D printing technology. We don't have these models, solid models that can actually respond to external environments, to external stimulants. So that's where something called 4D printing comes into the picture, to really address that gap or that constraint or that, that limitation of 3D printing. Okay, so this fourth dimension, what is this fourth dimension? This fourth dimension is that how can we have these models that actually are able to respond to stimulus, to respond to various types of, of stimuli, to respond to temperature changes, to respond to sunlight, to respond to moisture, to pressure. How can we have these models rather than just being a rigid, solid body that only has the geometry, the shape? How can we make these models actually respond to environments when we supply some kind of stimulation, some kind of pressure, some kind of a change in acidity, pH. So that's really the fourth dimension, making these models be able to interact and have some change in their properties when we provide these changes in the external environment. So this is a summary or a comparison between 3D printing, which probably we are more familiar about, compared to 4D printing. With 3D printing, printing we have the solid model, but we don't have that element of responsiveness to external stimuli. So that's where 4D printing comes into the picture. At this point of time, there is no such thing as a 4D printer yet. We are highly dependent on 3D printing technology. The change is only in the type of material that we use as input to the 3D printer. We are exploring smart materials. We are exploring a whole wide of 
a newer materials that we see have amazing properties that can really have an impact on our life. Okay, so this is an example uh, inspired because 4D printing did not really uh, was not really invented for a very long time, only about 10 years ago. It started with uh, MIT. MIT has something called their self assembly lab. So in this, one of their inventions, uh, they actually they are the pioneer in the whole idea of 4D printing. So this is an example of a miniaturized Eiffel Tower that they have 3D printed. This is a collaboration between MIT and University of Technology in Singapore. So this is an example of how 3D printing can be used to print a model that can respond to temperature changes. So in this model, if I supply a different amount of heat, that is going to result in a different amount of bending, a different amount of deflection, a different amount of straightening. So the input, the stimulus in this case is temperature change. But that temperature change results in some kind of bending, some kind of amazing change in shape, some kind of property change. So that's a clear example of an, an example of how the fourth dimension comes into the picture. Okay. So you might ask, okay, what's the whole point? Okay, fine. We have these amazing materials that can supposedly have the potential to revolutionize engineering and science. But what impact does it have? How is it going to affect me? How is it am I going to affect my daily life? So this is one of the inspiration for some of the research work that we are trying to do here in IIUM. I'm with the Mechatronics Engineering Department. So these materials, this shape changing, uh, or I would say shape memory polymers, all these amazing new smart materials, actually have the potential to be used in the treatment of heart disease. So in the treatment of heart disease, there is a procedure called angioplasty. Okay. So this is roughly what do we mean by angioplasty. Heart attacks happen because there is a restriction in the blood flow in the arteries of the heart. So when there is a significant amount of restriction in the flow of the blood in the heart, that is when heart attacks happen. So what Currently, one of the treatments for heart disease, or ischemic heart disease they call it, is that we go, we use something called a stent, a combination of a, something called a stent and a catheter. So it's a small, you can think of it as a small wire with some kind of circular device. So it travels all the way from a selected artery, sorry. it travels all the way from a selected artery all the way to, to the problematic coronary arteries that have that accumulation of plague or that blocked area. So this, the function of this stent is try, to try and open up that blocked blood vessel so that there is a better flow of blood. But the process of angioplasty is not something that's perfect. There are potential for complications, there is potential, there are medical risks involved. So with these new materials, there is that potential that we can actually improve the process of angioplasty, the limited, limiting the potential complications. So I'll show you an example. This on the top, this is an example of an artery that is blocked 100 percent So we can we can see that there is uh, the flow of blood has been shut off. But in the second diagram, when we have put a stent and we have opened up that blocked artery, we can see that the flow of blood has been significantly improved. So when the flow of blood has improved, then we are minimizing the risk of heart, dis heart attacks happening. The blood, the, basically the, the heart gets the oxygen, oxygenated blood that it needs. Okay. So some of the com potential complications that can happen when we use these stents, one of it is known as restenosis, and the other is known as thrombosis. So usually when someone goes and goes to the doctor and then the doctor says, okay, you need to have a stent, these are some of the potential complications that are actually told to the patient. So what happens in restenosis is simply on that metallic stent, there is an accumulation of scars or scar tissue, the medical word. So this accumulation of scar tissue, it results in a block to the blood flow. So we are back at square one. We have an artery, we tried to put a stent, but scars, scar tissue started to grow on the stent. Okay, and we are back at square one, the artery is blocked. And as for thrombosis, Thrombosis is also a side effect of angioplasty. It's such that on the stent, there is an accumulation of blood clots. So this accumulation of blood clots also brings us back to square one. The artery is blocked again. This is one of the reasons 
why uh, heart patients are given blood thinning medications to minimize the risk of blood clots uh, in the arteries. So here in IIUM, we are trying to look at how we can make better stents. So we're trying to explore different types of materials. We're trying to do some research to actually improve stents. Okay. So this is the research question that we are trying to address here in IIUM. So we are still in the very pioneering phase. We are still in the infancy stages. But we are, this is the research question or the, the burning passion, uh, so I might say. How can we make these stents better than how they currently are? Because stents are very rigid at this point of time. There is not really uh, in, any incorporation of smart materials or shape-changing materials or shape memory polymers. It's not yet widespread yet. But it's a good, it opens up the opportunity for research. Okay. So this is an example of a stent. So the, the, the research questions that are we, we are thinking about here in IAM currently is that how can we make these stents more personalized? Some people have bigger arteries, some people have smaller arteries. So rather than using a stent that is off the shelf, how can we make a stent that is more personalized or that will better fit to that, the dimensions of that particular patient? So that is something that can be achieved by 4D printing, a more personalized dimension for the individual patient's needs. And then another question to explore is that if the patient is a child, okay, a child eventually will grow. So how can we make stents that grow together with the child as they continue to grow? And also another question that we are looking at is the delivery of the stem itself. Can we use these 4D printed smart materials to be as small as possible so that during the delivery through the artery, we are minimizing any risk of any injury to the arteries. How can we use these materials to be as small as possible, but when they reach the desired target, they expand to the right dimension and to the right size uh, to actually open up the blocked artery. So currently what we are trying to work, to work on, we don't have um, clinically or commercially available stent yet, but we are doing research to try and see the properties. Okay, if we have a 4D printed stent with a certain shape memory, memory polymer, for example, how is it going to respond to temperature changes? How is it going to respond to different mechanical forces? How is it going to respond to different uh, flow rate of different fluid? So those are the, the kind of questions that we are trying to do experiments on and try to understand better. So we are also looking at what happens at the microscopic level to these stents. Because although we don't really have a commercially available stent yet, these are the questions that we need to address so that when we publish papers, all the research community can equally benefit from our findings. And eventually, uh, we hope that the knowledge that we share and the understanding that we gain can lead to better stents that can save more lives, inshallah. So, I would like to end my talk today with a quote I always share with my students. The solutions to the most complex problems may very well be inspired by the miracles of nature. Thank you. Salam alaikum.